This is Emma's Acres and Mission, where people come here on their own free will. They haven't got shackles on or anything. They get to choose what they want to do, but they want to do it. They want to do it because they're helping people. They haven't had that opportunity. They haven't had that chance to act sorry. And this gives them a chance. And so I really believe that this is a whole paradigm shift that we have a, on the verge of making a difference in the way we deal with criminal justice. Our idea was to bring people out of prison to the food exchange to work at the food exchange and instead of paying them, they donate their time so that the profit would all go to victims. What's great about farming is it's constantly a new something different happening and so you get people from prison who are so used to being institutionalized, so routine, so regimented and they come here and all of a sudden there's all this stuff that happens and then it's not even predictable what might not happen the same next year so it's just such a wonderful experience for them right they really get um, yeah I, I, an understanding that life isn't that routine that that's what happens to people they go into prison they get so into that routine they get addicted to it prison is a kind of an addiction and so lots of people go back to prison when they get out because they feel more comfortable in prison, believe it or not. I've had all about 100 guys go through here, and I think maybe at most three people that got out after they were working here have come back to jail. So that's like 90% of the people that come here get out and haven't come back. Ever. So this is a really good, real, like, model of what life is, right? This is life, right? It's growing things. And so, again, I believe it really helps guys and women to kind of just see how their routine can be challenged and how they can feel uncomfortable but challenge that comfort zone and, and get stuff growing and, you know and something happens right you know one of the things we're always trying to find and we'll get to that when we get back down that way is getting people here from the community but that's the other really big aspect of this is we have a lot of community people dropping in here uh, and it really makes people that are in prison feel like they're doing something important because these people are coming here, right? So it really means something to them. It's really symbolically a, a great thing for them to feel. It's the core of restorative justice is the community and the offenders working to help heal the harm that was caused by whatever happened to them, right? So if a victim, per se, came and said, well, I want all the kale that's in that field right now, we'd, we'd harvest it all. That one victim could take it all. Whatever they want when they come, that's what they get. If we got it, they get it. I'm not really a restorative justice person, exactly. I'm more a transformative justice. A woman named Ruth Morris, you should look her up. She was an amazing woman, Quaker, and she used to talk about transformative justice, not restorative justice. You can't, especially when you're talking about homicide, you can't restore that. The person's dead, right? And I understand that. I feel that, but we do need to transform that tragedy into something that's not just grief, not just anger and, and seeking revenge. We need to make that important. That person's life was important. And by making it something that's all about hate and revenge, we've really not put the value that we should on that life. We need to encourage people to do that, and that's what restorative justice really means to me. This is our, the totem pole, actually. This is the victim totem pole, so every totem on that represents a victim. So this is in memory of them. The very top one is after Emma, Emma's Acres, of which we are called. She was a very dear friend of mine. She was a minister, and uh, she was murdered. And so we dedicated the farm, and she's the top of the totem, right? She was a good friend of my grandfather's, actually, but my grandfather was a jewelry store, and my mom inherited it, and so she used to come into the jewelry store, and I'm about eight years old, I think, if I remember. I started meeting her, and I started going to her Sunday school, and then I started getting into trouble, and she used to come and see me in prison, and she used to write me letters and Christmas cards. She was kind of like my surrogate grandmother. I got, I'd been married before, and she, was, and she married me to my first wife. She baptized my kids. Um, and so I, you know, we were, she was, we were very close. She was just a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful woman, eh? And, uh, somebody broke in one night, I don't think they expected her there. He, they were, he was drunk and, uh, ended up killing her. So I, you know, I do feel the same, I think, pain. I don't, you know, push that, but I understand how victims feel. 
because I think uh, that loss to me was like I lost somebody that was like a family. You know? it was, she was very important to me. In fact, I just became a Christian in 82 and I'd written her and told her I'd become a Christian. She was so overjoyed. And, uh, and then a year later, she, she died. I wasn't sure I wanted to get out of jail. I'd found something in prison that I never had in the street. I was good at doing, helping people. I was good at caring about people. And I was allowed to do that because I was a Christian, right? When I was a prisoner, when I was a convict, I couldn't do that. You're supposed to stab people, not love them, right? You know, so I could do that, too. I did that when I was a prisoner. But I became a Christian, and I changed my whole approach to life and people and everything. And I found some huge meaning in that. So when she was killed, I it really hurt me. I was really, you know, sad and, and upset about it. And uh, I'm incredibly, this young guy... He was only 17 when he killed her, ended up getting sent to that prison where I was. So I was a victim who could have killed him, but I knew that's not what she would have wanted. And I was a Christian, and I had to live by that. I had to forgive and care about the people that harmed me too. And so I kind of didn't say anything to him, but I you know, kind of stayed out of his way, and then these Christian guards that, knew, that saw me as a Christian leader there came to me and told me about this young kid who was illiterate and who they thought was going to have some problems and I, if I could look out you know, for him. And then I got transferred to Mission Minimum, which was called Ferndale at that time, and he came there. So he's like he was following me around, right? <laughs> So he came, and I, by that time I'd started helping people get out of prison on parole. I'd been the assistant at a bunch of people's parole hearings. So when this kid showed up in Ferndale, his sentence it was life originally, but he'd been reduced to nine years. And so I knew he should have got had been had a chance for parole by the time he got to where he, at Ferndale. And so I asked him about that, and he told me that they hadn't given him a parole. And, blah, and I told him, "Well, gee, you know, maybe you should talk to me. I know a little bit about parole." And he said, "Well, maybe. I don't. Not sure." And he went away. But then a couple of weeks later, he came back and asked me if I could help him so I told him I'll, I'll meet you tonight in this very private location in the jail and we'll talk and so I got there and I told him and he knew somehow he'd found out even though I hadn't told very many people somebody told him that what was going on with me and him and uh, and he started crying and told me how sorry he was and you know I really believed him and I worked with him there and uh, finally and we went up for parole and he got parole and the parole board afterwards told me they wouldn't give him a parole if it wasn't for me. And so <clears throat> I know that's what she would have wanted. You see, that's what I really believe that victims need to be thought about, right? So not just the survivors, but the victim. And what would the victim want? And, I, and maybe there are victims that would want somebody that killed them to be killed or punished. But I'd suggest to you there's an awful lot of people that are killed that really wouldn't want that. They wouldn't really want to cause that pain to their, the guy's family or the woman's family. or They wouldn't want to participate in that. And so, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to really experience that and really feel the, just the, the beauty of love and, and of how, you know, forgiveness and compassion for those that have done you wrong can free you, not hate, not revenge. Those are just things that burn you up. I used to think that's what I had to do to survive. And then when I became a Christian, I realized that's not what you need to do to survive. That's killing you. That's just, and it's not helping anybody. So, you know, again, I believe that we get that message through here to people, right? That we live that right here every day.